this call. So uh, just a heads up that recording will start shortly. And Julie, over to you. Thank you and good morning. Welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Julie Veckerlein. I am Chief of Media Operations for the National Guard Bureau and I am moderating this on the record media roundtable. Uh, joining us today to speak specifically about National Guard efforts, I do want to say that any questions about active duty will need to go uh, to OSD Public Affairs. With that said, as of today, more than 6,000 700 Army and Air National Guard members from 16 states, including those in the disaster zone and those assisting from outside the zone, are actively engaged in response and recovery efforts. The response includes more than 40 rotary wing aircraft and nearly 600 military vehicles. Guard members are engaged in high water rescues, patrols, debris clearance, transportation of personnel and relief supplies, distributing aid to people impacted by the storm, search and rescue, route clearance missions, and other tasks. Today we have here Major General Wynne Burkett, Director of Operations at National Guard Bureau J34. We also have on the line from North Carolina National Guard, Colonel Paul Hollenack, 30th Armored Brigade Combat Team Commander. From South Carolina National Guard, we have Colonel Brian Pipkin, 59th Aviation Troop Command Commander. Colonel Jason Turner, Director of Military Support. Colonel William Matheny, Commander of the 117th Aid. From Tennessee National Guard, we have Lieutenant Colonel Meredith Richardson, Task Force 176 Commander. Major Hewlin Holmes, Medevac Detachment Commander. We will provide a complete list of names, spellings, and job titles uh, in our follow-up after this event. With that said, Major General Burkett will now start things off with his opening remarks. Sir, over to you. Julie, uh, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, and, and good morning and thank you to all of you. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to join uh, with uh, some of our states this morning uh, to help tell uh, the guard story in response to Hurricane Helene. Um, I, from the National Guard Bureau here in, in D.C., uh, like the states, um, we watched as the storm uh, approached, and and it was uh, a week ago today um, uh, at 11 p.m. when it first made landfall in Florida, um, and in the path, maybe not the full potential of the destruction was um, was known. And, and what I want to lead off with is uh, the the National Guard uh, Joint Force Headquarters in each of these states is embedded in each of their state emergency management offices. They've got LNOs that are out with those uh, regional and local uh, emergency managers. Um, and so they're looking at it together and, and they're looking at where uh, they, they can predict where maybe the, the worst effects may be uh, as the storm uh, migrates through, uh, through their state. Um, and we, as a result of that, um, are very effective in pre-positioning vehicles, um, personnel, uh, response capabilities, aviation assets uh, to areas where they are safe, but close to where we think uh, that need may occur first. Um, and that's one of the reasons that the National Guard can get there as quickly um, as they do. Um, but it's also because they're part of all of these communities. Um, and I think uh, what enables um, that quick success is the relationship uh, and the trust that the National Guard has uh, at the local level, uh, all the way up through the state level uh, for, uh, for those quick responses. Um, there are so many uh, great examples of, um, of uh, really heroic actions and, and right on time and just in time uh, support um, across all of the communities from Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, up into North Carolina and Tennessee. Uh, but a couple that I want to share with you because um, uh, they're gaining more traction, but it's it's just really remarkable uh, in Unico County in Tennessee. Uh, uh, the, it's the rain still coming down and a phone call comes from the hospital uh, to the flight facility. Captain Rodriguez and uh, that flight facility takes the call and it's a hospital. It's a three-story hospital. The first floor 
is completely flooded. The water's continuing to rise. Everybody's moved to the third floor and they need help. Um, it's still raining. Uh, Visibility is still, still poor, uh, but a combination of Tennessee aircraft uh, and boat crews um, showed up at that hospital and, and literally um, saved 80 plus people in that hospital. Um, and I know that there's examples of that throughout all of the states that I just mentioned. Uh, and, and I'll leave you with one other. Um, it was last Sunday, uh, North Carolina was, was trying to figure out how they get commodities from Charlotte uh, to Asheville. And in those early days, those early hours, those ground crews, those air crews are out helping to do, you know, life-saving, but, but as important, doing route uh, clearance um, and, and verifying which routes, routes are open and which are closed. And so by Sunday, there's a good indication that Asheville and those local communities are isolated and they're going to need support. And North Carolina used one of their uh, organic C-17s and moved a thousand pounds from those distribution facilities in Charlotte to Asheville, immediately set in with their CH-47s while they're requesting, uh, I'm sorry, medium lift helicopters while they're requesting additional assets from neighboring states uh, to start ring routes, to start pushing those commodities out to those hard hit areas and isolated areas. And it's just, it's it's a wonderful thing to witness. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to be, uh, uh, to be part of, and, and I, I'm just really, really proud of, of our guardsmen across all of these states, to include the states that are supporting as far away as Iowa. Uh, so, Julie, I hope I didn't take up too much time. Back to you, ma'am. No, very good, sir. Thank you. At this time, I have the list of the media joining us, and I will call on reporters by name uh, to ask your questions. You will be able to ask one question with a quick follow-up if needed. If your question is state specific, please indicate that up front so uh, the right person offers you a response. And so to kick off, uh, Lita Baldor from AP, do you have a question? Hi, good morning. Uh, just a quick question. At this point, are you requesting additional help from other states? Do you have everything you need? And is the guard requesting any additional help from, uh, from the Pentagon from active duty? Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, um, so the assessment of of needs and and uh, that that's going to be ongoing until uh, all of the 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 soldiers and airmen um, are are demobilized and sent home. So it's it'll be a running assessment, running damage assessment. Um, at some point, um, uh, they'll reach a point where the people that are on duty are going to have to be rotated out because they're uh, they're working around the clock um, very vigorously um, and where those states may start to lose um, some of that capacity. Uh, uh, my team and, and our team up here um, in, in support of the states, will start looking at what we can do uh, to augment them, uh, you know, in the days or possibly weeks to come. Um, so to say that we have everything we need, I, I, I don't want to say that out loud. Um, I, I feel very good um, with the communication that we have uh, across the states, in fact, across the entire uh, 54. I, I'm, I'm very, very pleased with the communication that we have uh, here in the Pentagon and with NORAD NORTHCOM and the capabilities that they're bringing forward, um, that if it's determined that they're needed, they can be, uh, they can be placed into action um, very, very quickly. Um, uh, Ma'am, I think I covered, I think I covered most of your question. I, I, I don't, um, I would let the states respond to uh, what they need maybe specifically from Title 10. But at this point, um, the, the states have been very, very good at, uh, at talking across states um, to get uh, the emergency management um, action compacts uh, in place and, and use resources from other states. Okay, so um, next we have Dan Lamoth from Washington Post. Hey, thanks for your time this morning. I know it's busy. Um, uh, General Burkett, uh, you mentioned at the top uh, that sort of the, uh, the the extent of the destruction was was not known uh, coming into this storm. Um, obviously, obviously, nature gets a vote here, uh, but but I wonder if this sort of event uh, prompts any kind of discussion about whether uh, it, it's time uh, as we see more and more of these storms and the unpredictability uh, increases 
uh, of increasing communication or prepositioning uh, more people or assets uh, in advance, um, or if that's simply not possible. Um, Dan, I, I think um, uh, my my experience is that after a storm, you know, part of that after action review is going to be what uh, or a response rather. Um, you know, what can we do differently uh, in the future? What what went really well? Um, and what do we need to examine and reflect on that didn't go so well? Um, you know, this is this is said it's a it's a one in a thousand year storm. Um, so it's it's very difficult to think that you're uh, completely prepared. But um, you know, all eyes right now are, are on North Carolina and Tennessee, um, and that's not to negate any of the great efforts in the other states. But this is going to be a a a long recovery process. Um, and, and even though all eyes are on those states and that appears to be the center of gravity, um, the center of gravity is, is where the survivor's home is. It's where their neighbors are. It's what they can do within their communities uh, to build those and, and, and make them more resilient. But uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll go back and look at where we reposition stuff and what we used um, and, and, and how we communicate. And I think that's, that's just a, an evolving effort um, that is done in the background. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, Haley Britsky from CNN. Hi, none for me right now, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Heather Lacey from Fox News. Okay, uh, Louis Martinez from ABC News. Hi, good morning. Thank you all for doing this. A quick question. Um, I, I heard your answer to Lita at the top uh, about the active duty. Um, but why do you think the active duty was called in for this? And then I have a follow on question. Thank you. Yeah, and, um, sure. I, I appreciate the question. I, I don't, I'm not the one to speak to why they were, but I will tell you that they are an outstanding partner. Um, they, they know because these are their communities too. They they know that they've got capability. They want to lean forward, and just like uh, everybody that I communicate with all day long, they they don't want to be late. And in an effort to not be late, you're going to want to push commodities uh, and capabilities as as far forward as possible. And then you just anticipate, uh, you know, what will be that need that you're called forward to provide. Um, so I I very much appreciate the relationship that we have. Uh, with the active duty as it comes to uh, domestic uh, response in the homeland. Great. And uh, a follow-on question regarding capabilities. I mean, you said this is a once in a thousand year storm, um, but the storm, you know, I think typically we associate the National Guard with follow-on, you know, with high water uh, vehicles, things like that. And in this case, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is, is that the scenario that we have here with those mudslides? Was it different? Um is this scenario beyond kind of the capabilities that you normally train for? So the the amount of destruction and specifically, I think I think right now we're talking about North Carolina, um, uh, it had to be worse not than what people were imagining, but you know when the storm passes and you're able to get out and do the assessment and you realize that the lines of communication are fractured and it's not just roads, it's communications, it's, it's you, you, you can't make phone calls to determine how, how people are, what the conditions are. You literally have to get out there uh, and see it, whether it's um, through aviation assets uh, or people on the ground. And you know, there's nothing in the National Guard that's immune to high water crossings. I mean, we've got high water vehicles, but, um, but there's limitations and limitations on what you can do uh, safely um, and uh, in speed, you know, you can you can rush into a, a really dangerous environment. Um, but um, um, you know, I wouldn't say that it was worse than what people thought was possible. Um, but I think you really don't get a feel for it until you you get out. And, and that's what makes every storm and every response uh, unique. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Gaines from NBC. Hi there, uh, Moshe Gaines with NBC. Uh, just a quick one. I was just wondering if there was any, if you all had any estimate of how many people may be unaccounted for at this time and how long it might take to reach folks, especially in, in remote areas. Yeah, um, Moshe, I, I, I'm, I'm going to defer to to any one of the state partners on the phone because they're they're going to have a much better estimate of what's happening within their state and the priorities uh, of effort within each of their um, you know, local counties or local uh, state emergency managers. So, um, North Carolina, can, would you would you like to illuminate on that one, please? Yeah, uh, yes, sir. We we don't we don't have a specific number for that right now of unaccounted. Um, I'd say emergency management is getting after that with the local uh, the local officials in that area as, as they're able to access more. So, I, I don't think that information is available yet. We are still doing significant flight operations. Um, in support of, of search and rescue at this point. So as we, um, especially given the size of the event and the terrain, as we still continue to try to access everywhere, we need emergency management to access to make those assessments and to provide relief. Thank you. Uh, and who was that from North Carolina, just for those folks on the phone who just spoke up? Yeah, this is Colonel Paul Hollenack. Thank you so much. Uh, South Carolina, was there something that you wanted to add to that? Ma'am, I, I will tell you, um, and, and Moshi, I, I think it's a great question, but but the Guard's focus is going to be, um, you know, initially on the life-saving efforts um, the, uh, the, you know, damage assessments, and then it's going to transition to uh, commodity distribution, um, how they can start getting in and helping to clear routes uh, uh, and, and, and restore connectivity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they're going to respond to those types of missions. Uh, and I, I think uh, probably the state emergency management office would be a better uh, source for the information of those people that are unaccounted for. Hey, sir, this is Colonel Turner, South Carolina. Jason, I'm here. Okay, Roger. Yes, sir. Uh, so from South Carolina, and as you've already heard from uh, General Burkett, the impact to the states are, it's a little different. Uh, so to answer the question unaccounted for, uh, we assist with that, but I don't have a definitive answer either. I, I know early on, the search is a most critical component of what we do along with our civilian partners. So at the, at the most safest point following the storm, that's, that's what we do. We, we search for people uh, with the intent of saving lives as, as fast as we can or as uh, widespread as we can. But that, that number may fluctuate by state, but I'm not tracking an exact number, uh, nor main or still that risk existing in South Carolina. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And Tennessee, uh, was there anything to add in response to this question? Uh, yes, ma'am. This is Lieutenant Colonel Meredith Richardson from Tennessee National Guard. Um, so I would just say we are closely in um, working with our county EMAs. And so our aviation crews are working um, diligently with them in order to reach all of the communities that may be cut off from ground transportation. Simultaneously, we are working to, to open up that infrastructure, whether that's through debris removal and the engineer teams, um, and also doing going out, doing convoy and route assessments and trying to find alternate ways to reach those ground communities. So that way we are, we are actively reaching every member of our state. Thank you very much, everybody. Moving on to uh, Ellie Watson from CBS. Thanks for doing this. Uh, two quick ones. The overall, how, how long do you expect the uh, response um, mission to continue? You were saying days, maybe weeks. Do you have a, a, an expected timeline? And then specific to North Carolina, uh, can you give us a breakdown of what, um, uh, what support the Guard in North Carolina is giving? Thank you. Yeah, and so um, Ellie, I'll, I'll start that and then I, I will transition to North Carolina. 
um, the the re the response um, is going to be a determination by the governors in each of these states when they can shift uh, life saving, uh, life sustaining to recovery and that longer term uh, recovery. Um, it's generally at that point um, that the National Guard uh, has a, a smaller and smaller and smaller role to play. Uh, but the prediction, uh, you know, by state or by area in each of these states is going to be dramatically different based on the conditions on the ground and where uh, the, the governor thinks um, they can make that transition. Uh, but to uh, North Carolina, please, to elaborate. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. I agree with you on that uh, answer. You know, for us, we're here till the mission is done. Um, however long that takes, we're, we're a week into it. I don't think we've made any. Uh, significant assessment of how long for now, um, but we're a lot of that is tied into emergency management. They track their lifelines um, as far as how they when services are restored and we can uh, we can get back to some semblance of normalcy in Western North Carolina. Uh, to the question of what support we're providing, uh, we have over 1,100 uh, National Guard soldiers and airmen on active duty right now. Almost 400 vehicles to include 26 aircraft. Um, and those we got support from 10 different states. So a lot of appreciation to our, our other state partners who have provided equipment and people to help us. Um, we work in force packages. So over 200 force packages have been activated, working out of 20 strategic locations across Western North Carolina. Yesterday, we passed uh, the million pounds of commodities delivered threshold um, with 600,000 pounds of that going by air. Um, so food, water, and supplies into Western North Carolina. Um, we've rescued uh, uh, roughly 500, over 500 people and 150 pets through the search, search and rescue operations. Um, working through clearing road obstacles um, is another major effort. So trying to get access um, and then continue to get those ground supply routes established into Western North Carolina. So that, that's it at the high level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have uh, Brad Dress from the Hill. Um, I do not have a question at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve Bainan from military.com. Okay, uh, Kimberly Underwood from Signal Magazine. Yeah, thanks for your time this morning. I wanted to ask if you could highlight some of the work you are all doing to support and establish communications and network capabilities across the various states and impacted regions, whether it's emergency communication networks or um, systems for residents. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly, I, thank you for the question. I, I'm 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 not tracking anything specifically that we are doing uh, for the uh, for the communi restoring communications. But I, I please defer to the states. Um, any of you that uh, have may have more visibility on how we're supporting that. Uh Ma'am, good morning. Lieutenant Colonel Richardson, Tennessee National Guard. So our support in Tennessee is is a indirect support. So for instance, debris removal teams that are opening up those trans networks that allow the crews that need to work on say cell phone towers um, or the critical communications infrastructure. So that way they have access to it. So we're primarily through that debris removal. We are, we are allowing them access in order to re restore communications. Uh, this is Colonel Holland, acting North Carolina. So very uh, similar as to what Lieutenant Colonel Richardson said, uh, you know, supporting our civilian partners, reestablishing, and then we also uh, try to bring Starlink capability to our emergency management coordinators when needed to help facilitate that communication, um, and in some cases to the public when available. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. C. Todd Lopez from DOD News. Hey, thanks. Uh, Colonel Hollenbeck offered a great breakdown of 
what was going on in his state in terms of the number of people, force packages, vehicles, and missions. Can can the rest of you provide a, a similar kind of breakdown of uh, what's going on in your state, people, equipment, missions? Thanks. This is uh, this, this is Colonel Turner, South Carolina. Uh, I will tell you that we, we have surpassed the 1,000 uh, number of personnel in South Carolina for military personnel for National Guard. And, and the great thing about South Carolina is that's Army National Guard, that's Air National Guard, that's State National Guard. So we bring to bear all the components and, and personnel uh, that we have in South Carolina. Uh, yeah, with South Carolina, and we mentioned it, uh, Joan Burkett mentioned the EMAC. South Carolina is supporting South Carolina and North Carolina uh, with aviation support. Uh, and from South Carolina perspective, the rescued number, uh, the last number I was given was at 32. Uh, and so that, that's a great EMAC uh, perspective of how the states effectively support each other. Uh, and there's really no boundary when that EMAC comes in play. We have, uh, we're in communication with eight states for EMAC. Uh, currently, right now, we have Florida, Mississippi, New York, and Michigan in support of the South Carolina National Guard. So they are flowing into the state. We will put them to work uh, once they get here. The main effort for South Carolina right now has been debris clearing. Uh, and based on the impact of the number of trees uh, the power companies, we work in concert with the power companies to ensure that power companies can have access to the locations they need. But clearing the roadway was the first and foremost uh, priority for the state. Uh, and then establishing communications, you mentioned that. Uh, in one scenario from an aviation perspective, uh, and Colonel Polanak mentioned it, we were able to use aviation assets to transport the communication personnel to get to the tower so they could do the work they needed to do uh, because the roads were not open. So another great example uh, of how South Carolina National Guard can help in that capacity. Uh, unless you got any other specific questions, there's a, a large composition of equipment and personnel, uh, but we've got aviation, we've got engineer, we've got logistics, we have drones, uh, we have multiple engineer type equipment that is on the road. Uh, so we bring to bear the equipment we have uh, to assist the citizens. Thank you. And so uh, this is Colonel Matheny. I'm the engineer brigade commander uh, for the 117th Engineer Brigade in South Carolina. I can talk and elaborate a little further on what Colonel Turner just gave you an overview on. Uh, we have engineers in all 16 of our affected counties and their initial set, uh, much like every other state, is to cut open a single lane of every road we can to allow those emergency workers to get into the affected areas and respond to 911 calls, as well as get those linemen in uh, and communication experts in to start with the, with the recovery of power and communications. And you've seen the pictures that, uh, that are coming out of all of the affected states, but our engineers literally had to cut themselves out of their own armories just to get roads open so that they can make contact with those emergency operations centers and get a picture of what was going on initially. Uh, we finished that up late Sunday and began expanding that effort to clear right of ways so that we could have whole roads open uh, in order to get additional aid to the citizens of our state. Thanks, guys. Yes, sir. So Lieutenant Colonel Richardson from Tennessee um, and, and Major Helen Holmes is on and he will touch on our aviation support. But from a ground standpoint, um, from from Friday, while aviation was simultaneously in the air responding to the hospital, we also had personnel on the ground in high water vehicles working with our emergency management crews, um, assisting with areas that we could get out to uh, with search and rescue and, and welfare checks. Um, in the, in our high water vehicles. Since then, we have grown to, um, on the ground side, just shy of 300 personnel. We are operating in six different counties. Um, we have a heavy engineer support, just like the other states, doing debris removal in order to open up that critical infrastructure. Additionally, we are working very heavily in supply distribution and commodities. We have 12 different points of distribution sites that we are manning, and we are also providing bulk water distribution.
distribution at shelters and medical facilities as water has very quickly become a, um, a, 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 a dire need across the communities. Um, and Major Holmes, I'll turn it over to you to allow you to answer on the aviation. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Major Hewlin Holmes, uh, Tennessee Army National Guard aviation lead. Uh, so currently we have nine aircraft that are that are dedicated in working operations through multiple different counties. And we have over 100 aviation personnel, both in crew members and support personnel that are helping to organize and, and, and go through mission taskings at this time. So uh, we have two medevac aircraft that are currently on immediate medical response that uh, in, anything that pops up, they'll, they'll immediately be available for. Uh, and then a bunch of lift assets that are doing water movement, supply movement, uh, any kind of equipment that is needed by these counties is currently being fulfilled by those. Thank you very much, everybody. Next, we'll have uh, John Kelly from C-SPAN. Okay. Uh, hey, it's Steve with military.com. Oh. I think I was muted on your end when you uh, would have, would have my turn if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, no problem. Hey, uh, uh, General, uh, storms like this are only going to become more frequent and severe as uh, the impacts of climate change develop in the, in the next couple of decades. Uh, does the Guard have any sort of a uh, what, what's kind of the years long outlook for how the Guard position itself? and any any sort of training or, or preparation for that because you got to juggle a uh, storm response like this here and that at any given time you guys have 20 to 30 thousand uh, at least uh, army guards been deployed abroad you know you got guys all over Europe and Africa and stuff like that so can, can you talk a little bit about uh, what the future for these responses and preparations might look like um, Steve I <clears throat> uh, you know I, I don't I'm not capable of predicting what future storms are going to be like it. I, I think uh, it's it's very obvious that uh, the intensity of um, weather patterns and the effects um, uh, are, are certainly making a difference. And you can see it, whether it's fires or floods or uh, or storms, it, it, it certainly appears to be intensifying. Um, our role within the homeland and our, our role um, as uh, guardsmen um, uh, has has not changed. We will continue to respond uh, to our governors, and uh, and I, I'm sure that I speak for all of them that uh, we take a great deal of pride in our ability to do that. Uh, but first and foremost, um, we exist in uniform uh, to train um, and to prepare to fight and win um, in in our nation's next conflicts. Um, in and every one of us takes that responsibility um, extremely seriously. Um, we can respond uh, in the homeland. And I think what's been missing in this discussion uh, up to this point um, is that the Guard, you know, while I'm incredibly proud of our response, and I am, the local community emergency managers and firefighters and EMTs and, and law enforcement and all the first responders um, they they were there before the, the storm hit, and they were certainly there as it was hitting, and, and they're an incredibly big part of this recovery. Um, and I, I think storms like we've seen in the last couple of years, why they do continue to intensify, um, you know, our community's ability to build resiliency um, and to respond and to help each other uh, will make us uh, much, much stronger. Um, the Guard will always have a role in that. Uh, but our role in, in, uh, in, in winning the next war is, uh, is our number one priority. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz Freedom from Fox News. Okay. Um, we have let me, uh, Patty Nyberg or Matt White from Task and Purpose. Okay, Brandy Vincent from Defense Scoop. Okay, uh, 
Matthew Adams from Stars and Stripes. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, this is probably more for the uh, state people. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you are seeing? Um, I know Tennessee mentioned um, needing aid and water and stuff, um, but what are, what are some of the other um, states seeing at the, this moment? Thanks. So from uh, South Carolina's perspective, this is Colonel William Matheny again with the 117th Engineer Brigade. One of the one of the hardest parts of this storm in particular is just the, the widespread nature of the, the devastation so directly impacted just as much as the civilian population and being able to bring them on as quickly as we can to assist with the recovery has been difficult. And then we're working those EMAX to bring in additional assets from outside the state so that we can hopefully free up our troops to get back and, and do what they need to with their families in their homes. This is uh, Colonel Paul Hollenack in North Carolina. I think, especially through this first week, uh, it's gaining visibility of the true needs um, and the location of those needs. Um, again, you know, for the terrain in North Carolina, it's extremely challenging in Western North Carolina where this damage is. So um, accessing that um, by air, uh, by ground, establishing communications, and then building a coherent picture so that the, the full force of the response can go to the right place is, is continues to be a challenge. Um, and I, I want to tie into something Major General Burkett said as well, while you know, we have over a thousand guardsmen who are you know, providing support to our state emergency managers, uh, we are dwarfed by the size of the civilian response um, who are on the ground and, and doing that work um, and then uh, trying to put this together with our interagency partners with FEMA um, in order to really uh, target that response where it's needed, when it's needed. Thank you very much. Um, next, we will have uh, Christina Wong from Reaper News. Okay, uh, let's try Lisa Geyer from German Press Agency. Okay, we'll try Yvonne Maliver from EFE News Service. Anastasia Obis from Federal News Network. None from me, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leo Shane from Military Time. Yes, hi, thanks for doing this. Um, I know you spoke that, that you don't know how long this mission will last and how long the response efforts are going to be there, but do you anticipate at this point the number of of troops deployed and the number of troops responding here to go up. I know that the the actual demands are changing as you go in away from some of the search and rescue and into the the clearing. Um, I'm just wondering if you're what what you're what you're telling folks in terms of what to expect as you rotate folks in now. And if you think that number is going to go up, or are we kind of at the peak at this point? Leo, I think um, kind of looking uh, at answering your question holistically. Um, I would anticipate the number to go up until it it doesn't. And and what I mean by that is, um, if if the states determine that they uh, they need more uh, capability or they need to start replacing uh, some of the formations that they have, um, then then we're going to provide that, and we're going to continuously look for solutions that would enable that uh, as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I don't want to jinx anything, but there's another system. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, making its way into the Gulf, and and it's not completely formed. Um, and even if it doesn't form, if it turns into a rain event, it could exacerbate the uh, the recovery operations, um, and and it could it could have some um, 
you know, negative uh, impacts to that. So we will continue uh, as guardsmen do until the governors tell us that uh, uh, that the um, you know all of our civilian partners uh, have have matters well in hand. Now I, I'll stop there and, and please any of the states uh, illuminate uh, if you can. Yes, sir. This is Lieutenant Colonel Meredith Richardson, Tennessee Army National Guard. Um, so we have liaison officers embedded with every county's emergency operations center that we are operating in. Um, so we are working very closely with those county EMAs and in discussion with them. As mentioned, they are still continuing to assess um, and determine what those needs are. So anytime that they come up with a requirement, we are working with them in order to help anticipate needs and we're able to respond to whatever the requirement is. This is Colonel Paul Hollander from North Carolina. I'm, I'm not sure if we're at peak yet. You know, we're still still developing requirements. I, I think in another week or so, though, we'll be looking at um, how do we rotate people out, uh, both for uh, their their own self care, um, as well as being very conscious of the civilian employers that we're impacting um, by having our our national guardsmen on active duty. Um, and it, you know, for an additional week or two on top of their normal commitment. So uh, we'll be looking at that soon. Uh, we'll be looking at that soon as well. Hey, thank you for that. We'll try Patty at Task and Purpose once again. Hey, one alibi from hey, South Carolina does. This is Carl Turner. Oh, okay. Uh, Patty, pause that for a second, uh, sir. Go ahead. Yep, I had the, I had the camera, not the, not the microphone. So, to answer the question, to increase uh, personnel and in, in forces, South Carolina is uh, continuing to increase forces. And the challenge, not only the personnel, but it's, it's the type of equipment. Uh, and so, as the, as the response continues, sometimes that response requirement changes uh, and you hope to think that you have the right equipment in the right location at the right time and 100 percent of the time we do uh, uh, but with these type storms you have to continue to bring in different capabilities uh, to be able to support the citizens to meet the intent uh, and do it as quickly as possible so from south carolina we we kind of manage a 15-day uh, planning period so we try to take a 15-day planning period and then we look 30 days beyond that uh, but we are currently in the process of continuing to talk to our, our brethren, sister states, uh, and also title. Thank you for that. Uh, Patty, task and purpose, over to you. Hey, um, so kind of going off of that, I'm kind of curious, for the helicopters um, from the units, is it mostly focused on search and rescue, or is it mostly bringing in supplies? And on the search and rescue, if there are any um, stories that you'd like to highlight, that would be great to hear. Patty, just to kind of set this up, and then I'm going to immediately turn it to the states, is um, each of the state responses will be different based on where they are in this response effort, um, and it'll continuously evolve. Um, I am incredibly proud, as I, as I always have been, how quickly um, these crews get out. And I think I mentioned it at the opening. Um, it's, it's still raining. Uh, the winds are still high. The visibility is poor. Um, but, but the experience um, and the focus on safety uh, and the crew's safety uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't inhibit them from responding and resp responding quickly. But over to the states, please. Uh, yes, so Major Hewlin Holmes with uh, Tennessee Aviation. Uh, so the demands continue to change. Uh, of course, very initially, uh, for the first couple of days, search and rescue was almost primarily the only the only thing our aviation assets did. Um, so from you know the the first thing we did was the hospital evacuation response. Uh, the moment we cleared the hospital, the crews immediately spread out into the entire county and just started uh, working on identifying those stranded personnel, uh, picking people up that were floating on debris and out of trees. And we continue to work very closely with the civilian agencies that were on the ground. The civilian uh, EMA response in those counties was was very impressive. Uh, and Tennessee prides itself in working very closely uh, with those first responder agencies and, and the depth of our communication network. So the taskings were coming immediately, uh, day one from those 
those needs for those counties, uh, and we continue to provide uh, services for their demands. At this current point, uh, most of it is primarily resupply operations, but we always have those medical crews and hoist capabilities on standby uh, the moment any kind of medical need uh, is identified. Uh, this is Colonel Paul Hollenack from North Carolina. I think we try to maximize use of airframes, um, meaning uh, specifically for resupply, try to use the medium and heavy lift helicopters to get the biggest bang for the buck, get uh, as much lifted as we can, uh, and using smaller airframes to uh, <clears throat> to, to do the uh, what rescue is left and what reconnaissance needs to be done by our civilian counterparts. Okay, thank you, everybody. Next, I have Gina Cavallaro from Army Magazine. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. Uh, back to your comment, uh, General Burkett, about about the rotations. Um, uh, it is a wide area that's affected in the, in the states that are covered here. Um, how do the rotations work and, and how many of, of uh, the Army National Guard soldiers who come from some of these areas have been affected? Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, so <clears throat> so our, our soldiers and airmen are in all of these um, communities. And I, I again, will defer to the states because I know specifically um, in some of the states there, uh, there were larger numbers than others. Uh, but in every event that we respond to, um, in addition to responding to the needs um, at the local levels, we're also checking uh, on the status of our uh, military families, and 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 that's that's everybody. That's the civilians that support our team, um, uh, as well as uh, the airmen and the soldiers. Um, so, <clears throat> so I appreciate you asking that question. Uh, but I'll go to the states because I know that. From Florida to Tennessee, there were there were different numbers in each state. Yes, ma'am. This is Lieutenant Colonel Meredith Richardson, Tennessee Army National Guard. Um, so, yes, to your point, simultaneously as we were spinning up emergency response missions, we were also working to to activate accountability for all of our air and army um, soldiers and airmen and families and our DA civilians um, that are working and employees that are working for us. So we were capturing that information. And as those needs became available, we were working diligently with our military family programs and any number of resources out there in order to get them aid. Um, I know here on the ground, on our ground task force, we have a number of people working that are from these communities. And, and for us, it is, it's an honor and a privilege to be working to serve our fellow Tennesseans. Uh, Colonel Hollenack from North Carolina. Um, we, we tend to activate for state active duty based on force packages uh, that are pre-planned and pre-assigned rather than by unit. And that provides us some common operating language with our civilian partners. Uh, and given how large the state is, we're, we're typically able to activate uh, from an un, uh, a part of the state that's not impacted. Right, so typically for hurricanes or at the coast, we activate from the mountainous area and vice versa for winter storms. Um, for this one, a little different where we're activating from more of eastern North Carolina to support western North Carolina. Um, we have had soldiers impacted. Um, I can speak, there, there's at least two um, in the state that, that I know have lost everything. Um, you know, we're providing services and taking care of them. Uh, one of those soldiers is in my brigade. Um, I was a student at Appalachian State, Boone. Um, from what was reported, lost everything, uh, drove to Durham to his unit, volunteered for state active duty, and has been on state active duty supporting his community for the last two days. So our guardsmen are very proud, just like Colonel Richardson said, to serve their communities. Hey, Julie, if, uh, <clears throat> if there's no one else that's going to respond, I, I, will, I will respond um, with uh, you know, this, this is a horrific storm. Um, and, and I've, uh, I've been in the national guard for, for many years. I wasn't here for the last thousand year storm, but, uh, um, but it's bad and, and it's wide reaching. And I can tell you that, 
uh, many of our guardsmen were impacted by the storm, whether they lost their house, uh, they lost their property, I'm sorry, they lost power. Um, some of them responded anyway, because that's what they do. Um, and it's it's incredibly, uh, it's an honor to uh, to be on a team uh, that's made up of of uh, great Americans like that, but but many of them were impacted: uh, loss of home, loss of power, loss of water, uh, loss of the ability to get in and out of their communities, um, and would need help to get to their armories. Um, I think the Tennessee engineer pointed out that they had to cut their cut their way out of the armories, uh, but but that's what they do, and that's the expectation that they have of each other. And this is Colonel Matheny again with South Carolina National Guard. Many of these communities are their hometowns, and even if they are currently living and working elsewhere, they come back to those units that are integrated into the communities, and they're coming back to help their friends and family that are still in their hometowns, um, even if it does mean that they're leaving their families, maybe in unknown situations, uh, many without power, some with, with damage to their homes. Thank you everybody for that. I do see that we have two quick follow-up questions. Uh, first, Haley, um, over to you for your follow-up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, Gina asked my question. I was also going to ask about guardsmen who'd been impacted, uh, but I guess if you can just kind of elaborate maybe for the states on what um, support is available to them. Uh, you know, are, are service members able to say, you know, I have a lot going on at home. Are you, are you even hearing that? Are we seeing what we saw in, in North Carolina that you mentioned of, um, you know, despite the loss of their own personal, you know, homes or whatever that they're still reporting for duty? Because if you just kind of uh, narrow in on that piece a little bit more, that would be great. Um, Haley, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to admit, I, there are a lot of programs. There's programs that... Uh, uh, because they're citizens, they can reach out uh, to uh, FEMA national programs. Uh, there's local programs in each of the states um, have uh, have options for them, but but they are are very they're varied, and so I, I don't have a short list. I should of those of those programs, um, but I, I do really appreciate the question. And not to put any of the states on the spot, but if you're familiar with uh, uh, with those programs within your state, either at the state or the national level, please, please chime in. This is uh, Colonel Turner, South Carolina. So uh, we have we have many local and civic organizations in the state. Uh, we. We also get support from local churches as well, and it's a community that comes together. Uh, we also have a, a large support contingency from the USO. Uh, our state has what they call a service member family care, and that unit is active 365 days, seven days a year. And some of the services they provide are employment, behavioral health, uh, counseling, things of that nature. Uh, and we use our chaplain corps quite extensively as well. Uh, we have placed chaplains at our points of distribution to communicate with the soldiers uh, and offer offer that faith assistance to the citizens as they come to those points of distribution. <clears throat> so our chaplains are out there. So as Colonel Burkett said, there are a, a wide variety of, of resources and organizations that come to bear in these states. And, and a lot of times you don't know where they come from. Uh, and it's it's kind of the group effort, the team fight. One team, one fight that, that we keep with our EMD, state, uh, federal partners. Uh, but those are just a few from South Carolina that we've used. Thank you. I guess this is. Lieutenant Colonel Meredith Richardson, Tennessee National Guard, to, um, as Colonel Turner mentioned, we in Tennessee as well, we have a department uh, dedicated to military family programs. Um, and so they are really, they, they are the tip of the spear for providing that support to those families. And they can pull from any number of, be it through military aid um, or those civilian agencies that Colonel Turner alluded to, and they will make sure that they answer the needs of the soldiers and airmen that we have.
Thank you, everybody. Dan, would you like to uh, ask your follow-up question? Uh, sure, thanks. I, I think in part it may have been answered at this point, but but I, I guess as we're looking at overall numbers here, uh, can you speak to any challenges you've had uh, just in terms of getting uh, manpower up uh, as people are juggling uh, either emergency responder jobs or uh, you know devastation in their own lives? Thanks. Dan, I, I think um, uh, rather generically, I, I think the, the challenge initially is uh, while you're out um, doing the search uh, and, and rescue operations, um, doing that wide area assessment of, of the impact of the storm uh, and where those heavy hit areas are, where those areas that are isolated um, so that you can start developing a short list of, of the capabilities that you need to uh, to respond and um, and and that and that that takes a while um, um, and I you know and, and it's different um, you know this storm hit at, at 11 p.m. Uh, initially in Florida uh, and then obviously swept through the states at different times but um, you know some of that has uh, uh, an impact as well but if you can't get out in um, where there's where there's still enough light to to do those assessments then. Uh, it slows uh, it slows the process down. Um, but as soon as um, you've got the <clears throat> the capability to get out and 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 really do a good assessment uh, of your area and how far reaching it is, um, then you can identify the capability that you need and whether it's organic uh, to your state or you have enough of it and uh, what you need to reach out for assistance. That process uh, across the National Guard happens very very quickly. Dan, this is Colonel Matheny from South Carolina. The, to elaborate on a few points that other speakers have made, that was definitely part of the issue to begin with, was getting a clear picture of the, the scope of the problem and getting the requests from the counties for what they were seeing and what they would need. I would, I would say that we had an initial set that was well positioned to start opening those roads and getting those assessments done. Uh, but understanding the scope of the problem uh, was really what impacted our ability to get people on and address what those resource requests were going to be. Anticipating those is one of the things we do really well, uh, but understanding what the counties were able to do themselves versus what they were going to need assistance with took a little bit of time. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. So Lieutenant Colonel Richardson, Tennessee National Guard. Um, so to go along with what Colonel Matheny from South Carolina said, so we, um, it, this is happening in, in the far eastern region of Tennessee, and we have service members responding from as far west as Memphis. So that the distance right there did become a factor. Um, and that is where for us, it was critical liaisoning with these county emergency managements. And so as we were anticipating either through known logistical shortfalls or as they started doing their assessments and they started saying, hey, we, we think we may need this resource coming forward. We were simultaneously planning and, and conducting um, preparations in order to activate that, that requirement, especially if it was coming from West Tennessee. So that way we could get it here as fast as possible and into the fight. Uh, this is Colonel Holland, Act in North Carolina. Um, I think the, I talked a little bit about our force package structure before. I think that gives us a bit of an advantage. People um, know they're on a state active duty force package. The equipment's identified, it's tracked monthly. Um, so it's not a surprise when you get a phone call for that state active duty. I believe you also asked a question about how we handle first responders. Typically, we don't, we don't add them to a state active duty package or a standard one because we know that they are gonna end up having to respond on their own. Uh, through their own agency so we don't pull them we don't want to pull away from our civilian partners uh, to fill our own needs um, and then we we have a heavy use of liaison teams and the county emergency management offices and that's one of the first things we get out there um, to help drive that information flow to drive requirements to bring in follow-on whatever follow-on uh, forces and, and um, equipment people whatever the requirements are for that area to get them back on their feet Okay, thank you for that. I, I have just a few more on my list and then we'll be wrapping this up. Um, Sybil Mays Osterman from USA Today, are you on the line? Oh, 
Okay, and then um, I see that we have Will Dunlop with AFP. Are you on the line? Do you have a question? And then Joe Folsom from Fox News. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, in that case, I'm going to uh, wrap this up. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Please feel free to send any additional questions you have to our National Guard Bureau uh, media desk email. Uh, you should have uh, received our advisory and our link from that email. That is the best way to contact us at any time it goes to multiple people, so we avoid that uh, that pipeline, right? And um, we will follow up as soon as we can with any additional questions. Again, I will be sending out a list um, of the names, spellings, and titles of those who have participated today. Um, so with that, again, thank you, everybody, and have a fantastic day.